Um, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Irish Influence. Um, thanks as always to the Irish Consulate in Boston, people there, uh, to Irish Studies on Campus in Boston College and Boston College Island, and the people you never see who make this whole thing happen, uh, Peter and Claire, who make the technology work. Um, but Joe, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, hopefully you can make the rest of it work tonight. <laughs> Thank you very um, much, Mike. And introduce our lovely guest. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, and nice to see everybody out there. Our guest this evening is Eve Watson. Eve is from West Limerick, just about. We'll talk about that later. She's one of Ireland's foremost academic and clinical psychoanalysts. She's published internationally on topics such as sexuality, culture, literature, film, psychoanalysis, and the role of psychotherapy in the modern era. Eve is the co-editor of the book Clinical Encounters in Sexuality and is the editor of Lacune, the international journal for Lacanian psychoanalysis. She lectures at various colleges, universities and institutes of psychotherapy, psychoanalysis and teacher education. So there we are. Eve Watson, very nice to have you here. Thank you very much, Joe and Mike. I'm delighted to be here, very honoured indeed to be asked and, and delighted to be joining in uh, in what I imagine will be a fairly lively conversation. Sure, what else would you be doing on a Friday night in May in the middle of a pandemic? Except having lively conversations with psychoanalysts where we're all going to end up. Uh, Eve, Eve, I, I, I suppose one thing I wonder is, is just how you came to this profession or how do psychoanalysts come to this profession? Are they, are they born or are they made or what's your own story? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think psychoanalysts are born. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Um, but maybe I could say a little bit about how I came to it. Um, I came to uh, psychoanalysis 20 years ago, formally, uh, when I had lived abroad for 10 years. I'd gone to university in America and then uh, continued living abroad. Um, moved to the Far East and then moved back to Ireland uh, about 2001. And in moving back, I decided that I wanted to pursue um, studies in, in, in psychology, in mental health. And I stumbled upon a course in psychoanalysis at Dublin Business School. And in the course of my investigations of that course, I recalled what I had forgotten, which was that I had studied Freud and Lacan as an undergraduate at university, uh, which is a very rare thing to do, <laughs> to study Freud and particularly Lacan at, at, at undergraduate level. Um, and I needless to say, I took to this course like a duck to water. Um, and within a few weeks was completely hooked into particularly Lacan. Um, and, uh, and his particular uh, approach to psychoanalysis, a very linguistically based approach. I suspect we, we might come back and, and, and say a little bit more about that later. And then I uh, embarked on a, on, a, on a master's, a clinical master's um, at, at St. Vincent's uh, University Hospital um, under the auspices of UCD. And then going, wanting to go a bit further, I did a PhD specializing in in psychoanalysis, uh, which is also quite unusual, um, it has to be said. And I've been in practice for, well, heading, heading, heading for two decades now. <laughs> so in practice, as a practicing psychoanalyst, but also as an academic. And, and I just wonder, actually, which, which of those parts of your life is most rewarding, most fulfilling with dealing with a patient or speaking to the students? Hmm? Oh, I, I couldn't say. I, 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 the, if you'd asked me this question a number of years ago, I would have given you a very different answer to the one that I'm going to give you now, which is I really can't separate them. I'm not avoiding the question. Mm -hmm. I really do enjoy my clinical practice more than I more than I ever have. But very, very few psychoanalysts, psychotherapists, psychoanalysts work full time in clinical practice. It's just it's just too demanding. I think I know maybe one person. Who, who does that. It's very, very unusual. Um, so it's very good to have something else to do. And to be able to teach is a wonderful compliment to the clinic. It's a way of, well, I find it's a great way of posing clinical questions that arise. And I can assure you they arise every week. Uh, there's something that comes up. So it can be a good way of doing that, but also a way of keeping sharp and keeping fresh, because there's nothing like, as you both very well know, as, as, as academics yourselves, and I suspect a number of people out there in the audience will know only too well, there's nothing like standing in front of a group of fresh-faced students who you realize know far more about what's happening in the world than you do. 
<laughs> um, and that's actually really important. It's, it's pretty humbling, but it's also a great, it's a great learning environment. So they're a very, very good complement. And it's very rare, I should say, uh, to be able to get to teach and lecture in psychoanalysis and practice because, well, there are very, very few positions in Ireland and, and you know, I've, I've, all of my work is it's adjuncting and, uh, but I'm very fortunate that I get to be able to do as much teaching as I do. I'm invited onto various courses and institutes and they allow me to, to have my psychoanalytic way and to teach uh, modules uh, um, entirely through psychoanalysis. And it seems to go over well, particularly on programs and institutes, for example, that look to teach their students a multiplicity of approaches and they seem welcoming and, and I'm very glad and very grateful that they allow me to go in and, and, uh, and introduce the students to, uh, to psychoanalysis and they seem to like it. Can I just, just remind the audience, if you've got any questions for Eve, then use your question and answer text box and we'll read them out. And just returning to something you said a minute ago, Eve, about you know, taking a PhD in psychoanalysis. And obviously, again, we'll get this later. Psychoanalysis is something that arrives in Ireland late, post-war, um, sits a problematic relationship with the church, I suppose, or Irish conditions. But then you're saying you took a PhD. I mean, was that, as it were, freakishly unusual when you were going down that path? I mean, were you a, the, the lone PhD in psychoanalysis? Has it, has it changed in the last 20 years? I mean, as a, as a kind of profession or a space with an Irish life, has it been altered and transformed? Well, I think it has in the last, well, more than the last 20 years, in the last 40 years in particular. I mean, as, you, as you said, psychoanalysis arrived in Ireland uh, in and around the Second World War. Um, but it was a, a, a sort of variation, if you will, on, on psychoanalysis. Jonathan Hanahan uh, was responsible for, for, for in, in, in through, uh, through his connection with Ernest Jones, famously Freud's biographer, bringing, uh, a, a, I suppose, a variation of psychoanalysis, very unusual variation of psychoanalysis to Ireland at that time, kind of a com combination of spiritualism and, and psychoanalysis. Um, and, but, but he was a very charismatic uh, personality um, and very rigorous in, in working with, uh, with the texts and, and, uh, and a lot of people, uh, not a lot of people, uh, 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 people found him to be uh, uh, you know, enlightening in many, in many ways. And that, that led to others setting up reading groups and, and, uh, and going into analysis and, uh, and growing from there. Um, still very, very small and very nascent. In the early 80s, um, Cormac Gallagher, who uh, had in fact attended some of Lacan's seminars in Paris, um, established um, a, a course of study at, at, he set up the School of Psychotherapy at St. Vincent's Hospital. Um, and he, he collaborated with two very, very important uh, psychiatrists there, Professor Noel Walsh, Walsh and Professor uh, Dr. Mary Darby. And they set up this, this course, which would eventually become the Masters in, in Psychoanalysis that, that most of us of, of, of my generation and before, and, and it's still indeed going strong, this, this, this Masters program. He set this up and, um, and it, 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 all of this had emerged out of, out of a reading group he had set up and the translations he did. He undertook translations of Lacan's seminars, this life's work of, of Cormac, making Lacan available in English uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, Anglophone Lacanians or Hiberno Lacanians, if, 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 if you will. And, um, and, and, and that has, has grown over the years and, and really, really developed. And it was through the School of Psychotherapy, um, which ultimately was able to get its master's program recognized by UCD, that I was able to do a, a UCD, a, a PhD at, at University College Dublin, um, through the School of Psychotherapy. And I was not the only one. I was one of one of three of my particular group, and there were there have been several others since, um, and um, it is it is it is through the through the school of medicine. Mine was a theoretical PhD, but they've become much more empirically focused now, as as is as is the way of of the university. So I think I was one of the last uh, doctorates to slip in that was uh, that was uh, theoretical, <laughs> primarily theoretical. So it was a great opportunity, and uh, I was very very glad, very lucky to have that. Um, indeed um uh, so so that was a, but to go back to something earlier uh, when you asked joe if, if psychoanalysts are born or made 
I would say not only are they made, but psychoanalysts, when they begin their course of, of training, for the most part, have absolutely no idea as to whether they will end up you know, being psychoanalysts and practicing psychoanalysis. It's a, it's, it's a risk. It's a risk without guarantee. And that is because one simply doesn't know until you go through a course of, of study. But it's, it's referred to broadly as a course of formation because one of the requirements is that one goes into one's analysis. Right. And it's there that you really uh, wrestle with the question. And really one is obliged to wrestle with the question, why would you want to become a psychoanalyst and to come up with some kind of reasonable answer to the question? So, so, you, so, so some don't necessarily uh, go on to practice, but they, you know, when they, when in going through a, a course of study or a training, that's not ever a, a guarantee. Um, so it's, it's unusual in that way. So definitely made, Joe. So why, why the question you, you left hanging there was, was, why would you want to become a psychoanalyst? And I suppose my question for you then has to be, why did you want to become a psychoanalyst? Well, you're, you're, uh, what, what, what do I want to say now to that? What, what, what will I say to that? <laughs> um, I, I've always been intensely interested in people. And that is a primary requirement for anybody in, 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 in psychotherapy, in, in psychoanalysis, in, in working in, in the arena of mental health. Um, and um, it occurred to me over the years that I, you know, I really ought to do something about that. That, you know, that I, 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 I've, not only did I find it easy to speak to people, but I just knew, for example, to keep counsel. I knew to you know, keep things private and confidential. Um, but I also really enjoyed engaging with people's stories. Um, and, um, and that's it. I mean, that's really what an analysis is on many levels. It's, 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 not, it's not a diagnosis that comes into the room. It's a human being with a, with a story. Um, and often they, they have symptoms and a particular suffering that they're describing, but it is a person with a history and a story. And every single person is different. Um, and if, if you think about, you know, whether you have two people that you meet or 10 or 15 or 20, every single one of those, those, uh, those, those stories and histories is different. It's unique um, and it's had very particular influences. So to remain alert to that uh, and to be able to work with that one by one in each of their singularities requires being interested in people and being endlessly interested in them, really. Um, and, um, and it's very nice to be able to put that to some kind of use. So you must listen, you must show interest, and you must, is there, is there a step, what's, how do you help the person? Well, I mean, talk, it's, this is talk therapy. So, um, so, you know, that, that, so if we think about talk therapy, we think of it as, a practice of speech. So, um, so, so a person comes along, they usually arrive with some kind of problem, a symptom, or something has happened, something has repeated, they have some kind of suffering. Often they can't explain it. They don't, they don't know what, what it's about. They just know they've had enough of it or it stopped working. Sometimes people have symptoms for a long time and they sort of do okay with them and then they stop working for them. Um, or, so, or there's a life event that occurs, a bereavement, or something, something has changed. Um, so, um, so it's about, it's about uh, um, I suppose, um, um, offering a, a, a presence to the articulation, really the enunciation of this person's story, mm. which will be largely unknown to them. Um, that's, I suppose, that's, that's the practice of psychoanalysis is premised on, you know, what fundamentally drives us is a knowledge that we, that is just, it's outside of our conscious grasp. Now, we broadly refer to that as the, as the unconscious. It's the forgotten aspects of, of who we are. It's the repressed aspects of who we are. Um, it's the unlikable aspects of who we are sometimes. Um, and at, from time to time, this, this, presses upon us and, uh, and, 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 and often produces a conflict. And this was Freud's genius, I think, was to, uh, was to I recognize that every symptom 
was, was, was indicative of a conflict, an irresolvable conflict that was in, in a way being resolved or satisfied in the symptom. So you can already begin to hear how psychoanalysts don't work with symptoms as necessarily noisy nuisances that have to be eliminated, as you would typically find, say, in contemporary biologically based psychiatry, um, but as um, actually having something to say. Um, and, uh, and it's important to be able to, uh, to hear what that is. But it's fundamentally important that the patient or the analysand, as we refer to the patient, is the one who hears it. I mean, it's no good that the analyst ultimately is the one doing the hearing. But, you know, sometimes this requires um, some guidance and, and in, uh, occasionally some interpretation and, uh, and, and intervening sometimes. Because the amazing thing about the practice of speech, which is what a therapy or an analysis is, is that because it's speech, we always end up saying more than we mean to say. That's, you know this from, from, from you're your all wonderful practitioners of, of literature, so many of you, and, and, and language in your own ways. But when people speak, they always say more than they intend to, or what they say is never quite what they intend. Um, and, and it's so rich and filled with, uh, uh, with possibility. So it's in, the very, it's in the very act of enunciating, of speaking, um, that, uh, that uh, and this was uh, Lacan's idea of the unconscious, is that it's not a place. It's not something you get in a lift and press the button to the basement. It's in, <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the very things that we say. Uh, it's in very speech itself. Um, but of course, that's based on, 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 on entirely on Freud's idea that, that uh, the unconscious is, um, is eminent in the psychopathology of everyday life. The psychopath. So what's that? Slips of the tongue, slips of the pen, bungled actions, those moments when we mean to go someplace and we end up someplace else, all of those things that we do that are part and parcel of, guess what, everyday life. So there's endless material to work with. That's, that was wonderfully, wonderfully, beautifully explained there, Eve. Thank you very much. My... I was just going to say, I mean, going back to two terms you used there, forgotten and repressed, and just thinking about the months and the guests we've had here, a lot of people, be they writers, historians, you know, wherever they've come from, the conversation quite often goes back to the Irish experience of some kind of trauma, be that personal, be that family, uh, you know, the Northern Troubles, uh, clerical abuse, mother and baby homes, and even reaching back to the experience of the famine, colonization and so on. And I'm building on that idea that you just touched on there of the, the forgotten, the repressed. I mean, do we arrive at a point where, I'm being a bit flippant, but I think it's a, a genuine question given how much in the media we, are, we, we talk about different traumas in the Irish experience. Does Ireland need more psychoanalysis in most places? Oh, I don't know. I, 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 my immediate reaction is to say probably yes, because there isn't such a tradition of psychoanalysis here. I mean, you don't switch on the news or read the newspaper and come across even the word psychoanalysis very often. It's at the very bottom of the, 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 the size, the, you know, the, the size being the, the, the term for, for the, the the, the, the modalities, mental health modalities in Ireland, it's at the, pretty much at the bottom of the pile. So not like France, for example, where psychoanalysis exists in the wider public domain. People know what it is, it has a place, um, and psychoanalysts are part and parcel of institutions, of hospitals, um, of, of, uh, of the fab very fabric of society itself. Here, we don't, we don't have that. Um, and, um, and, uh, so we have we have some work to do to uh, uh, to I suppose to promote psychoanalysis and to ensure that there are psychoanalytic voices, for example, partaking in our major institutions, um, in, in you know in places where decisions and policies are made. The vast majority of psychoanalysts are working in private practice. Um, there are psychoanalysts um, who are also. Um, who are working, you know, in the not-for-profit sector for charities, um, and you know, and 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 in the field of medicine uh, as well, and and uh, you know, a whole and and in, in all kinds of pastoral care services and settings. 
Um, but uh, so I would say absolutely. I would very much like to see. The problem is, is that we know we are in the era of cost cutting, of short term therapies, of the dominance of CBT, where promises are made of cure within six, nine or 12 sessions. And psychoanalysis comes along and says, well, analysis is going to take the time it takes. I mean, it might be phrased a little bit better and a little bit more delicately than that. But that's effectively, you know, what, uh, what it, it doesn't promise. It, 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 one can't predict how long it takes to, uh, for a person to feel, uh, to feel better uh, from, from their complaints. It takes them a long time to identify what their complaints are, first of all. But also, fundamentally, we would say, you know, the existential, what does an analysis do? I would suggest it provides a theater for the existential dramas of life. You're not going to do that in six, nine or 12 sessions. Um, it, would be, it would be great if, if you could, but it's just not how, how it works. Um, and uh, and, and you know, uh, uh, people of course want answers. And uh, of course people want answers. Um, and, but again, you know, uh, 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 an analysis would, your works on the premise that that the answers that are being sought, at least initially, while important, are actually not the most significant thing. Um, there's a there's a there's a, an existential, a fundamental question. So it's about identifying what that question is for each and every person, um, and it's pretty fundamental. It's often you know involving something around sex, something to do with sexuality. Um, uh, and taking up a, a, a sexual position, or even about life and death. So these are so getting to that and forming a question. Never mind coming up with uh, some kind of answer to that. Uh, giving these things the, the necessary time. So uh, so you know, it's, I'm not being. I don't, don't wish to be gloomy here. I mean, that's this is this is the this is the, how interesting I would say the work is. But uh, it doesn't fit in with our economies of scale, mm -hmm. with our short-term therapies, and and the idea that that uh, that things can be addressed at the level of behavior or social programming. We, you know, that, that's 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 the kind of talk people like to hear. But it uh, and but it's you know it's it's. Uh, it's uh, people often come for analysis having been through those shorter term therapies and uh, um, and, and and perhaps gotten something. So I, I don't wish to be entirely negative about them at all. Of course, they, they all all therapies have a place, um, but uh, people often wishing to to go further and recognizing that while they may have done some work, they have a ways to go. Thanks, uh, a, a theater for for those fundamental existential questions that that, that have to be faced and then maybe just come to terms with are conceivably dealt with. That's excellent. And the title of this here is, is, is kind of tongue, tongue in cheek about can we psychoanalyze the Irish? And, and it, it's a trope that one might have heard actually occasionally, you can't psychoanalyze the Irish. A, I suppose I'm going to ask you and, and Sean Kennedy, hello, Sean, how are you? A friend of us all here um, asks that question, can the Irish be psychoanalyzed? And, and the second part of that question is that presuming that they can to the degree that anybody can is, why do the Irish actually love that supposed fact about themselves? Oh, you can't psychoanalyze us. We delight in that notion. Anything of those? Yeah, it's it's a great it's a great question and an inevitable question from from your your titling of the talk. And hello, hello, Sean Kennedy um, out there. Um, uh, of course, the Irish can be psychoanalyzed. They they have been psychoanalyzed for for, for decades. Um, um, but I suppose the, the, the it, I, I, no one is quite sure of the provenance of this of this supposed assertion of Freud's that the Irish can't be psychoanalyzed. And I, I heard in the last number of years that it was actually uh, 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 something that Freud said about the Welsh. Um, that the Welsh couldn't be analysed, but it really wasn't about the Welsh. It was about the Welsh man that he had grown particularly frustrated with, Ernest Jones, who he was starting to fall out with and who had, uh, if you know the history of Freud, had entertained notions, shall we say, of, of, uh, of getting together with Freud's daughter, Anna Freud. So, um, so I, I can't verify that that's, uh, that that's, uh, that's true, but that's a fun way of thinking about it. Um, uh, the the our the idea of liking this uh, this notion that we are unanalyzable, um, well, I suppose you know it does kind of fit in with um, you know with the with the idea of sort of competent individualism. Nobody likes to think 
uh, really, that they can't analyze themselves or that they can't figure things out themselves. Um, so, you know, in a way that that sort of fits in with a kind of um, ego idea that we have that, you know, that, uh, that, that we, that, you know, an analysis going into analysis with someone else um, and other is required in order to get to the, to the, to the bottom of, of, of who one is uh, or to make some, gain better insight in, into, into who one is. That's a kind of blow. That's a narcissistic blow to the ego. Um, why it's a particular narcissistic blow to the Irish ego um, well, I mean, we might be able to trace, I don't know uh, what uh, the others of you think, and some of you may have a much better answer than me, but I mean, the fact that we ha were so um, um, under the influence of Catholicism for so long, um, and, you know, that that is actually very significant. And um, and with the decline of religion, with the secularization of the country, and really with the, the, the decline of, of other you know, I suppose in some ways the legitimacy of our institutions, there has been a growing demand for therapy and for, and for analysis. So you could say that with the decline of the church, um, it perhaps freed people. And, uh, uh, and as Freud predicted, he predicted that people would become neurotic with the decline of religion. Uh, that's in the very famous civilization and its discontents. Um, and uh, I think that, 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 that is very, very much the case, that uh, whatever your thoughts about uh, uh, religion, uh, it does provide uh, all kinds of things, like, for example, the notion of cause um, and cause as, as, as external. And, uh, and psychoanalysis would, would take a very different approach, which would uh, locate cause internally. Um, so they're incompatible in that way. So, so they're you know so it, they're, th th that may be playing into that in 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 some kind of way. Uh, that it occurs to me. That's great. Thanks. This is this is a silly one. Just just go with me. You you've mentioned Freud, philosophy, and correct me if I'm wrong. You're you're more in a Lacanian position yourself. Why is it that Freud, in terms of popular culture, every he's everywhere. He's in costume dramas. There's, he was in Doctor Who. Freud is just almost the popular cultural go-to psychoanalysis. Lacan, as far as aware, has not been in Doctor Who, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why is one so visible and one not? When obviously, in terms of psychoanalysis, they're both equally important. Why is Freud so powerful with popular imagination? Well, I think um, wasn't the interpretation of dreams voted uh, into the top three most influential books of the 20th century? Um, I mean that that so that tells us. I'm trying to remember who did the, the survey. It was a reputable one, but I can't remember offhand. Um, no, it wasn't a, it was, was it a Melvin Bragg list? Melvin Bragg did one of those lists a few years ago. It may have been anyway. Uh, no, I think it was something like the, the Times, or, or <laughs> I, okay. I, I, if I remember correctly. Um, um, I suppose, well, we have to remember that, that you know, Freud worked for, for pretty much nigh on 40 years and produced you know, what are now collected into 24 volumes of the standard edition. That's 24 of these. This is number 21. Um, so you could spend a lifetime reading, <laughs> reading, uh, reading his work. So he had an awful lot to say. He had an awful lot to say and an awful lot to say about an awful lot of things. Um, and what he had to say was uh, significant. Um, it was. It did not go over well for the most part. Um, uh, you know, people still, uh, you know, object enormously to uh, so much of what uh, Freud uh, has. You might say has wrought. Um, he predicted that he would. He and indeed psychoanalysis would always remain unpopular for two very very important reasons. One, psychoanalysis offends against. And in our intellectual sensibility, you know, and we it be thanks to the Enlightenment and and uh, and uh, a certain uh, Mr. Descartes, you know, we are rational thinking beings. I think, therefore, I am. Um, uh, you know, the idea that we're driven by something that we are unaware of, and we need to do some work to get to know and to get to terms with is offends our intellectual sensibility, our post Enlightenment intellectual sensibility, um, but also. He proposed that because uh, sexuality, and in particular the idea that our sexuality forms pretty much from the get-go, including in infancy and childhood, not, of course, equivalent in any way to adult sexuality, but that proposition would offend against moral sensibility. 
that people would take great issue with this. Even though he said you have to close your eyes and your ears uh, to see that that children, you know, aren't you know little little lively little sexual beings in their own kind of way. And the process of socialize the socialization of children is about you know, and this was Freud's idea is about reining in those drives and making them socially acceptable. Um, but this, this, you know, this is, this is, uh, uh, so, so what he had to say is monumental, you know, in terms of, and, and also adding in that we are driven by dark forces, <laughs> you know, it's not all happiness, light and love uh, the drives are also aggressive, death bearing, filled with hatred. Um, and we hate our neighbor often. Um, uh, in fact, primarily we have a great problem. With, with our neighbor. And he marveled at the processes of, 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 of love and sociability that we have cultivated and that we cultivate both at a social level, um, but also within, uh, within familiar contexts and, 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 and how individually the psyche um, you know, adapts, if you will, and, and comes to live with these darker forces. You know, this is this is this is not the humanism of of Buber. Uh, this is not you know these other uh, uh, you know uh, you know this is not uh, what people really want to hear. Um, so so he's he's you know it's not that he brought a message of of doom and gloom at all, but he did point out um, uh, uh, um, important aspects of the human condition. Um, that we really struggle to reckon with, and we continue to struggle to reckon with, but yet we can't put them away. So Freud continues, and he continues to be influential. And most of the depictions of Freud, and there was a Netflix series on there recently about him, which was abysmally bad. And you know, so you know, they nearly always get it wrong, and they focus on all kinds of nonsense. But um, uh, you know, it, it's, it is very, very interesting. I mean, even to go back, and I was looking at this today. Freud's analysis of obsessional neurosis as being akin to a personal religion. Um, you know, it's just a beautiful essay, creative writers and daydreaming. That's a, that's a good one for the, uh, the, literary, the literary of you out there. Um, never mind the three essays on sexuality, where in 1905, he has the audacity to say that there's no preordained object or aim of the drive. I mean, this is... I, I would arguably today, um, uh, you know, astonishingly enlightened. There is no predetermined object or aim of the drive. And also that uh, heterosexuality is just as much a problem to explain as much as homosexuality. I mean, this is in 1905. <laughs> not bad, not bad. I mean, there are things he does go on and say that are, you know, uh, you know, you know, he was, you know, his ideas about women um, uh, um, leave a lot to be desired. It, it has to be said, but he had some very, very interesting ideas on maternity and the and the and the impact of maternity. So, so you know, it's it's people are inclined to um, uh, judge Freud. I would say on on uh, some of the the livelier things that that he said, and that he probably wouldn't wouldn't write today. He's also, and I don't know if people know this, but he famously went back to, uh, uh, to uh, his, his case study of Dora uh, 20 years later and corrected it and acknowledged mm. that he had made a significant mistake. Mm. How many case studies published today do you see writers daring to go back and do that and, and risk that? And it was because he had advanced it. I mean, he invented it. So he's in you know, he's advancing it as he goes and he goes back and corrects it. Um, and it is so interesting to see that, but it's also a great lesson, I think, for, for anyone in the field, you know, that, that uh, um, uh, we're not always right. And, um, and we, you know, we work with what we have now, but uh, that doesn't mean that we can't, uh, um, you know, continue. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, all of this is, is evolving. It's still evolving. I mean, there's, there's too much Freud and Lacan. I mean, there's, there's also, of course, Melanie Klein and Wilfred Bion. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many other psychoanalysts. I mean, there's such an emphasis here because I'm trained in the Freudian Lacanian tradition and Lacan based much of his teachings on the work of, of Freud. Um, but, you know, it's, we still have a, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do still. I, I would continue the question of sexuality, actually, and I know your particular interest in sexuality and in queer studies. And I want to come, we assume here in Ireland with the decriminalization of homosexuality in the gay marriage referendum about which we're still, I think, 
applauding ourselves, can we assume that issues of queer sexuality are no longer the stuff the Irish analyst has to deal with? Or are they? I wish that were so. It's a, it's a lovely idea. I see absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. I see no evidence that, that, uh, that suffering, shall we call it, in the field of sexuality is on the decline um, for anybody, uh, including uh, those who, um, who identify as, as gay or lesbian or bisexual or queer, indeed nowadays gender neutral, non-binary, there's a, very, a range of, 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 of ways in which people can, can identify. But I, I see, I have to say, I see the same, I see the same old problems. I see the same old um, problems of relationships not working out. Um, um, things are still not working out between two people. That hasn't changed. Um, there's no question that the advent of these uh, uh, of these legislations has made a huge difference uh, to people and lived lives. But you know, at, at a psychological level, I still see uh, people struggling to come out, um, which may surprise you. Um, but it, it continues to be a, a difficulty for people. And if you think about it, it will make sense because even though um, it has become much more socially acceptable now to uh, you know, that heteronormativity isn't quite in the ascendancy that it, that it was, it continues to be in the ascendancy. Let's not forget that. That's the first thing. But secondly, parents have expectations of their yeah. children. And that's never going to change. And children, no matter how old they are, are terrified of not meeting with those expectations and with disappointing their parents. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that, that problem will, is probably going to be around till the end of time in, in different forms. So it continues to be a, a difficulty for, 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 for people and, and young people. While at the same time, I see lots of evidence of, of young people coming out now in, 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 in school, in secondary school, um, and, and, and having a much better time of it than, than people would have had even 10, 15 years ago. Like, so, so they're real advances. But when people are coming to therapy, they're not coming for what's gone well. They're coming for, for the difficulties. And so basically, I would say relationships continue not to work out and, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, coming out continues to be uh, a, a, quite a traumatic process, I think, for, for, for some people. Thanks. Thanks very much. Just a very specific follow-on from Christopher. Um, how has the church uh, sex scandal affected your work? Have you noticed a rise in volume of patients as now there is much more public reckoning with this situation? I mean, the big, big stories, and that's been running for decades, affect the kind of the way people are accessing your services. Well, it's made it, it's made it, I think, the, the, I mean, we, we are still coming to terms with the breadth and depth of, of, of what, what was going on. Um, and this, the recent Jesuit scandal, you know, that was the last remaining uh, bastion of the, of the clerical orders that, that seemingly didn't um, mm -hmm. partake in, 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 in violence, physical and sexual against children. That's, that's now not the case. We now know that, uh, that there, it was also going on there. Um, it has increased the demand for mental health services, but uh, a lot of those uh, people are older. Um, um, remember, um, there's, there's an age profile here, um, and there may be a certain reluctance to engage with, uh, with therapy. Uh, you know, they've, they've found a way, if you will, to, to, to do what, they, what they're doing. At the same time, um, you, you, you know, I think it's more acceptable and it's, it's available to them uh, to take that up. There, are, there, are, there is a very important service uh, that our health, our national health service provider, the HSE provides, uh, the National Counseling Service provides dedicated psychotherapy and counselling for those who have been victims of sexual abuse, institutional and clerical sexual abuse in, in Ireland. So that's a very important service that is out there. And sometimes they, when they are, have, have too much, they, they, it goes out into, into therapists in, in private practice who, who take, you know, who sort of, it's kind of contracted out if, if you want to use that kind of language. So, so we would see people, uh, we would see people that way. Um, I, you know, I would love to see uh, more people engaging with, with the service. Um, I think it's really important we find ways to work with older, with older people. Um, 
there may be a lot to work with and not a lot of time to do it. But we really, uh, I think it's, 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 it's something we need to look very carefully at uh, and look at ways of, of, in, of encouraging people, if they choose to do so, if they're willing to do it, to engage uh, with, the, uh, with, a, with a, a talk therapy about their experiences. And there's a question from David Gallette, which is sticking with the Catholic uh, Church issue, but also about the business of being a psychoanalyst. And he wonders, in fact, if Roman Catholic confession itself was in some sense a form of talking cure for some people. And, and he continues with, and if not, why not? Thoughts on that? Thanks, David. Yeah, thanks, David. Um... It's a great, it's a great question, and I, I think you're right. I think you know the, the uh, you know the confessional you know is a way of of talking about and, and acknowledging misdeeds, um, and also a way of being forgiven. <laughs> um, yeah. I suppose there is an element of the confessional uh, in a, in a, in a therapy in an analysis, but it's so much more than that because the confessional, of course. You know, it, it, it you know involves without without doubt um, a judgment. You know, a judgment, a penance um, that must be that must be undertaken to to uh, uh, to to mediate uh, to mediate the sin. Um, whereas an analysis, you know, it it it, it there, as I said, there can be confessional aspects to it, and that's really important. But not having a judging other makes it something very different. Um, it means whatever internal agency that's hard at work doing that can be given voice, but it also allows maybe for the work to go a bit further, if you will, than, than, uh, than that of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a solely confessional uh, nature. And I think Eve, uh, Michel Foucault actually places confession and the trident and obligation to confess and to search into the depths of our souls in order to find those ugly little bits uh, at the heart of the twistedness of, of, of Western sexuality. So indeed, David, at least for him, um, it certainly isn't. And indeed, I think he sees confession as being uh, the cause of, of, of much of, of a large part of our anxieties. Sorry to be sounding like I know something that I don't know. Um, but uh, can, can I just, uh, we've got a question here actually from, from Guy Biner indeed. And, and I wonder, he's wondering if you have anything to say about Nancy Shepherd Hughes's controversial book, and I think this was about the 30s or so, Saints, Scholars and Schizophrenics, or was it 50s? Mental Illness in Rural Ireland, a book which made a mark in anthropology, but as she herself admitted, caused considerable ire in Ireland. Are you familiar with that work of anthropology? I, do you remember, was it the 30s or the 50s? And I'm, I'm sorry, Guy, I'm not familiar with that book, um, but I would love, uh, I'd love to know more about it, and I suspect you know quite a lot, uh, you know, quite a lot about it. Yes, in 1979, it is, of course. Yes, it's Nancy Shepherd who's it's 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 not uh, the Kimballs and those things. Thanks, thank you, thank you. But of course, there was this perception, Eve. Indeed, uh, I remember these statistics when I was young, and they were thrown around as as being factual that the Irish had the highest rate of schizophrenia in the world. Was there ever a truth in that, or where did that emerge from? Would there be any any thoughts about that nonsense, if nonsense it was? Well, I, I can't say I've come across that. I mean, I've, I've, I've um, um, certainly, you know, we have, you know, we, we, we're coming to terms with our history of, of, of uh, institutionalizing um, schizophrenia and the psychoses and, and all manner of things um, um, until very, very recently. Um, so we have not, you know, given this the kind of accounting uh, that it that it that it requires. Uh, there's still a, a lot of work that needs to be done to 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 take proper account of that. Um, I'm not qualified to 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 be able to comment on that on 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 the on the level of schizophrenia in Ireland. I don't really know. I mean, I'll certainly look at the Shepherd book and 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 have a think about it. Um, I, you know, I'm, I, I, if I may, just a small little anecdote. Um, I, I remember when I was doing my 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 uh, my clinical studies, the, my master studies. We we had a, a, a lecturer, Olga Cox Cameron, who had great knowledge of of the of the history of of psychoanalysis and the history of of the relationship of the Irish to mental health in Ireland. 
And, uh, and she reminded us that, uh, that there was uh, often uh, people suffering from serious uh, mental health issues would be sent down to a place in County Kerry called Glown mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, And they would actually do quite well. They'd calm, they'd integrate into the community. People would actually do quite well. And it was only, this had been going on for hundreds of years. It's down near Car Sivine, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and, um, and it transpired years later, they tested the water. And of course, there's a chemical property in the water that, uh, that uh, uh, is now used in, 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 in various drugs, antipsychotic drugs, that, uh, uh, that it, it resides in the water, in the well, in this particular, in this particular place. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful story. Um, and how, what, a, what, a, what a, 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 an important um, uh, contra, uh, narrative to to the you know to the uh, specter of institutionalization that uh, that you know this these asylums that we've we've built and we've been maintaining uh, for the last few hundred years which we are now of course dismantling uh, and and doing much better but we have a long way to go to um, to to fulfill the promise made I have to say by government in 2006 called a vision for change about making community uh, mental health services available respectfully to all in the community. We have still a long ways to go with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Can you. I just shift tack Eve? I mean, obviously, you've kind of spelt out for us why psychoanalysis is such a useful way of understanding humans and human relations. But in a way, from where Joe and I stand, and obviously a lot of some of the people listening in, how should and what's the value of psychoanalysis for historians, for literary criticism? What should we do it when we're reading text and reading the past? Mm. Well, the psychoanalysis has been used across a variety of disciplines. I mean, it's it's a it's a fairly significant uh, you know cross and interdisciplinary tool. It's used in film studies, as as I think you know, in literary studies, in literary criticism, um, and um, um, and well, really a range of of, of other disciplines as well. So, so it has that, you know, the one of, I suppose, the, 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 the body of theory is so vast. And so, I mean, the application of, of, of psychoanalysis uh, um, to other disciplines and its theoretical use has been around for well, since forever, really, since, since uh, well, well, I, probably since, since Freud's death. Um, and, 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 and that's because uh, psychoanalysis provides very interesting conceptual tools um, and concepts with which to uh, engage, you know, in, in, in thinking about um, uh, all kinds of things, uh, you know, when it comes to literature, thinking about um, uh, narrative devices. I mean, not you know, all kinds of 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 of, of, uh, of interpretive. It, I suppose it provides a set of interpretive tools which can be added to other interpretive tools, and it's it's it tends to uh, to be quite widely used. And there's some very very good work uh, that that has been done and continues to be done. And I think even uh, arch critics of Freud, like Fred Cruz, whom, uh, whom I remember back in UC Berkeley, uh, while he absolutely dismissed um, uh, Freudian therapy as, uh, as, as a tool in the clinician's uh, offices, he actually accepted it indeed as having, as having value within literary criticism. And we've got a question from Archery House that asks us to think a little bit further about the uses of psychotherapy within the world at large and our attempts to understand the de developments within the world around us. And she asks, do you think psychoanalysis can offer us insights into politics? Perhaps in particular, recent political de developments in either the US or in Ireland? Yeah. Oh, I think so. I think without a doubt. Um, and, um, and that's why it would be lovely to, you know, from time to time to hear psychoanalytic voices added to the debates uh, um, that are, I mean, if you turn on television in France, um, you, you have psychoanalysts contributing to political debate and political discussion. We're at, you know, a million miles away from that here. <laughs> I know that. Um, but um, uh, you know, it, 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 there's something of a balance here because, there, again, you know, these, these interpretive tools to think about you know, to think about the drives, to think about uh, um, uh, to think about um, 
uh, the ways in which um, uh, what is what is repressed returns. Um, you know, all you know, uh, to think about what is symptomatized in an institution or in a group, um, to think about the kind of discourse and language that's being used. Um, and these are just a few things that come to mind. Um, you know, this it can only add to uh, to an interrogation of of something. Um, and indeed, p- um, people have been working hard, and people have actually been uh, providing some very interesting analyses. Um, particularly of the pandemic, I would say, um, and and the impact of plague um, uh, over the, that we've all been so affected by. Um, I, I mean, there have been some analyses of of, of Trump um, uh, that, that have also been been very good. Um, I mean, I would certainly like to see to see more of that and more more inclusion of that. But but at the same time, um, you know, uh, you know, it, Freud was very was very clear that in no way could psychoanalysis ever develop into a Weltanschau, into a kind of worldview, uh, that once it embarks down that path, it's no, it's no longer true to its, uh, to its tenets. Um, um, and that is, uh, so, so, so something of a balance, I think, would need to be struck here. Um, but I would very, very much like to see, I mean, there are some, I mean, Darian Leader, for example, in the UK contributes to The Guardian frequently, and he's a, 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 a psychoanalyst, a historian, a researcher, a political commentator, he's all, got all kinds of things. Adam Phillips, uh, very, very good work, um, and other people in, in the States too. So, so the, the, and people seem to find their work interesting. Um, I would say, Marjorie, your question is wonderful because it's my observation that analysts are actually quite slow to do this and venture, you know, they're so used to, I think, being in the private domain of Mm -hmm. the the clinic. Um, And, um, you know, even for me, this is a very public thing to do. It's one of the most public things I've, I've done. I mean, I give talks and go to conferences and things, but but you know, it's just they're not used to putting themselves out there in the public domain um, and 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 venturing that, um, and um, and and so you know the, the, that's one reason I think why we don't uh, we don't see that much of it outside of say the francophone uh, world and maybe I think in in parts of of, of South America. Um, so so it would be good to see uh, more uh, more. I mean, it's like well, this should be writing letters to the Irish Times. For example, I mean, how many of those have you seen recently? Not many, none as far as I can tell over the last while. You know, so so it just you know, we, and we get you know, we're and we're we're busy, we're caught up in 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 what we're doing. But uh, but there, it would be it would be good to see. But also, of course, um, there is a problem as well with uh, with very very few psychoanalysts, you know, being given or being able to access you know the kind of security that you might find, say, in an academic post. I mean. Who gets that anyway today? <laughs> you could say that's a problem for everybody, but they're very, very few. You know, and it's from that kind of position as well. You might say that a, a person might have uh, something to say in, in in a public way that might be picked up too. So, so there are all kinds of ways of thinking about it. But fundamentally, it's a great question, and uh, I I would say there's a, a much more work to be done there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, one question I know. Joe had for you, but I'm going to kind of add one of my own. Um, question one was just simply, do you have a couch? Um, and question two, if you do or you don't, which historical figure would you love to put on it and to psychoanalyze? <laughs> well, okay, I'll go with the easy one first. I do have a couch. <laughs> um, so who's and... going on it? <laughs> just say, if you want to see my couch, it's actually a video has been made um, that is now you can watch it uh, on the Freud Museum Vienna website, uh, where a number of, of women analysts around the world are, are interviewed and they talk about their work. And if you look at that, you'll be able to see a certain someone who's speaking here now, but you'll, more importantly, you'll be able to see the couch, the famous couch. Um, so, uh, so that's leaving that almighty plug aside uh, for now. Um, uh, who, would I, who would I put on it? Um, gosh, who would I put on it? Oh my goodness. Um, I mean, there's a, whole, a number of people going through my mind. I'm thinking of, um, um, hmm. 
Hmm. I'm thinking of Hannah Arendt. I'd love to have her on the couch. Um, I would, I'm, thinking, I would, I'm thinking of people that selfishly I'd learn a lot from, you know, from, from what they have to say. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's what, I'm, what I'm thinking of. You know, I mean, you'd like be shuffling James Joyce in your door if I, could, if I could get a chance. I know that he was reluctant to take you guys on, but perhaps our, if you guys were reluctant to take him on. But yes, uh, that's, that's someone. But you know, psychoanalysts say that because <laughs> he didn't go into analysis, he, you know, he was as creative as he was. So <laughs> we have to keep that in mind. And, and, um, and there's more questions coming in here now. And actually, I just see a comment from uh, Sean Kennedy, uh, who had wondered about whether the Irish could be psychoanalyzed or not, but of course knew the answer too. But he believes, in fact, that that trope originated with um, Cahill, that man Cahill, who wrote the book called How the Irish Saved Civilization. Does that sound likely? I mean, well, why not? Um, that, that could be Tom, Thomas Cahill. And actually, as Sean writes in Thomas Cahill, SJ, I didn't know there was an SJ attached to the it end. It was an SJ, yeah. Well, there you are. The Society of Jesus, for, for those not in the know, that would be a, a Jesuit, yes. <laughs> and, uh, a couple more questions here, Eve. Uh, Bill German, why is therapy mainly for the wealthy, where psychiatrists in most countries are funded by the state? Mm -hmm. yeah 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 it's it's you know we we you're right um um and i as i as i already said i work in private practice so it's 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 fee paying so people come along and they and they pay a fee um it shouldn't be so um this should be much more widely available and properly organized through our our our, our you know our state and 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 community institutions um it's absolutely something to work towards mm -hmm. and i know that uh, that uh, uh, um a number of people that uh, that I'm working with are very in, interested in this idea. And, uh, you know, Freud, for example, you know, talked about the importance and indeed had a number of free clinics, um, really important. I mean, it's, it's a difficult one because, um, because, um, you know, there, you know, in terms of, of the technique of psychoanalysis, the idea that one pays for it in some kind of way, is one of the fundamental aspects of it. Now, money is the usual way to do that. It's not the only way. You know, so I'm thinking of a, of a colleague who's worked for many years in the prison service um, here in, 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 in Ireland. And he speaks of it's, prisoners can't pay money, they don't have it. But what they pay with is um, what they're subjected to um, and the ribbing and what they get from the other prisoners in going to their in going to their therapy, they pay a price for that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's paid for in, in some, so you, you know, that something is, is given over. So there are ways in which this can be uh, thought through as very, I, I mean, I, I don't, I think pe pe people must pay something uh, for it to mean something, for it to be valuable. So, so that, that needs to be ne negotiated. Um, and, uh, but, but also I would say um, every practitioner I know, um, Part of their practice is low cost um, and they accommodate a certain proportion of their practice is given over e those including those in private practice to those who can't pay who can't pay the fees we're, we're, we're running short of time here i just want to throw out a question from sean kenny i don't for a moment expect you to answer it but it's one actually we're thinking about he wonders about the gaelic and english and the symbolic order there is a fracture he says and a continuity do we speak it gaelic the irish language or not a huge question, as he, as he, as he recognises, but well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the language question and the can and Ireland, and that's going to be for an other day when we have you here or somewhere else. I great question. And we have great. questions here from as well from Rene Fox, actually, another one from David and Paris that we're not going to get round to, indeed. I think that we're going to have to just speak for a second about who we're going to have next week, Mike. Can you tell us something about that while I do that next week? Yeah. yeah. So next week, everybody is um, next Friday, the 14th of May, uh, usual time, 9.30 in 4.30 in Eastern Standard Time. It's the art historian and critic, Emer O'Connor, uh, the rather brilliant Emer O'Connor, uh, who had a recent book came out about maybe six, seven months ago, where she looked at the whole question of art and Ireland and Irishness, but how that played out in the Irish diaspora, and that's both artists who are living within the diaspora, but also exhibitions that the state, private individuals, foundations, etc., 
talk to, particularly America. Um, so it's going to be fascinating to hear what she's got to say. So you can register as usual on Eventbrite, uh, watch it on um, YouTube, wherever you join us, wherever you watch us. But that's next Friday, so we could. Thanks uh, very much, Mike. And thanks very, very, very much, Eve. It was absolutely marvellous having you here. And um, just thank you for coming and thanks to everybody else for coming. And uh, just to remind you all, actually, that if you've missed any of these along the way or if you want to listen to Eve and watch Eve a second time around, then going to the same Zoom link, uh, YouTube link that got you here, will give you the whole host of the various Irish influence uh, interviews that we've done over the course of this semester and last semester and lots more to come. Thanks everybody very much. Thank you. Eve. And could I just say thank, oh, thank you, you to you okay. both. Um, thank you so much. And also it's very rare for psychoanalysis to get this kind of outing. And I want to extend my appreciation to you both for facilitating that, but also for making this such a lovely experience. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Wonderful. Thank you.